In our previous videos, we already talked about linear voltage regulators. With them, we can build power supplies very easily, but there are two things they cannot do. For once, they cannot make the output voltage larger than the input voltage, and secondly, they are not efficient. That's why so-called switched mode power supplies were invented, which is what we are going to talk about now. You can find the previous videos about linear voltage regulators in the video description. As explained there, these circuits are very simple, but the problem is that the excess power is simply converted into heat, which is extremely inefficient. It is therefore much smarter to use a switched mode power supply, which do a better job regarding efficiency. Here the energy is first transferred to a storage element, like an inductor or capacitor, and then switch to the output of the power supply. Depending on the topology, we can increase, decrease or even invert the input voltage. The nice thing about this kind of power supplies is that in general the output voltage only depends on the duty cycle of the switching element. This makes regulation of the voltage really easy. Diodes and transistors, especially MOSFETs, are often used as switches. There is a variety of switched mode power supply topologies that can be used. In this and the following videos, we want to have a look at the most important ones. The first storage element we want to take a closer look at is the capacitor. Let's assume we have a loaded and an empty capacitor. Both have the same capacitance C. If we connect the loaded capacitor C1 with the unloaded one C2, charges will flow from C1 to C2 until an equilibrium is reached. Since each capacitor now carries half of the charge, the original voltage at C1 is halved. If we add two switches to the circuit and open and close them alternately, we have successfully created a circuit that halves the input voltage. We can compare this process with two glasses of water, one of which is full and one is empty, representing the charged and discharged capacitor respectively. If we connect both glasses at the bottom, a water flow will occur until both glasses have the same amount of water. This represents the current flow from one capacitor to the other. Another idea is to fully charge two capacitors with the same capacitance in parallel and in the next step connect them in series. The voltage over the two capacitors is now twice the voltage before. Again, we can use two alternating switches to get this voltage doubled. If we want to have negative voltages, we can flip a charged capacitor and connect it to a load. Of course, with this topology, we are also able to generate higher or lower negative voltages. All these types of circuits are called charge pumps and are often used for low power supplies, for example for lever shifters or to generate a small auxiliary supply. If we take a closer look at the charging mechanism of a capacitor, we may stumble upon a curiosity. Let us assume that we have a charged and an uncharged capacitor. The charged capacitor has a stored energy. The energy in the uncharged one is of course zero. After recharging, both capacitors have the same voltage and therefore the same energy. But if we add up the energies of the two capacitors, it is only half the energy of the previously charged one. So where did the second half of the energy disappear? This problem is known as the famous capacitor paradox, and the answer to it is simple. In this case, the charging of a capacitor can no longer be described with ideal components alone. If you connect the charged capacitor to an uncharged one, ideally an infinitely high current would flow during the charging process. Of course, this is not possible, so we consider the whole process with a resistor between the capacitors which limits the current. During the charging process, a current flows through the resistor and generates power loss, 
or in other words, heat. This accounts for the missing half of the energy. The remarkable thing is that this happens independently of the size of the resistor. Only the time varies. In practical electronics, you try to minimize the charge flow, which can be easily achieved by making the second capacitor smaller than the first one. You can also limit the discharging voltage of the second capacitor. With these methods, we are able to achieve an efficiency up to 90%. Now we have seen what we can do with just switches and capacitors. But there is a second important storage element in electronics, the inductor. A similarity to the capacitor paradox can also be observed in inductors. We can take two inductors and let a constant current flow through one of them. Next we connect a second inductor in parallel. A magnetic field will build up in the second one and energy will be transferred to it. Now only half of the original current flows through both coils. If we again calculate the energy before and after, we see that half of the energy is lost in the exchange process. One important note about switching inductors. Switching off an inductor without load often makes problems. Since the inductor wants to keep the current flowing when the switch is opened, the voltage at the switch would increase to infinity. With a real switch, at some point, the voltage would be too high and it would be destroyed by a developing electric arc. This is a big issue when switching off inductors and the reason why we often need so-called flyback diodes to protect the switch. But how can we use the behavior of the inductor to convert voltages? As already mentioned, the stored energy in the inductor will cause a current flow in the connected load. If we connect the resistor as load, we get a voltage drop according to Ohm's law. If the load is a capacitor, we store the energy of the inductor into the capacitor. In principle, we have charge flow from the first energy storage element to the second one. Similar to a charge pump, this can be done by two alternating switches. As we can see, we get the negative voltage at the output. This is basically an inverting switched mode power supply. In another video, we will see how we can control the output voltage and what other parts are important for our power supplies. Now we want to choose the right diode for our application. One problem is the voltage drop of a normal silicon diode of approximately 0.7 volt in forward direction. Multiplied with the current, this results in a power loss in the diode that lowers the efficiency of our power supply. One solution would be to replace the standard silicon diode with a so-called Schottky diode, which only has a voltage drop of about 0.3 volt in forward direction. As a bonus, Schottky diodes have a higher switching speed in general, but unfortunately, they also have a higher leakage current in reverse direction. Up until now, we have successfully replaced one of our ideal switches with a real electronic component. The second switch has to be actively controlled, for which we have many kinds of electronic switches. To keep it simple, we want to focus on a very efficient switch, namely the MOSFET, since the switch has a big influence on the efficiency of the whole power supply. We will not get into detail on how this switch actually works since you can find the links to these videos in the video description. We just want to focus on the most important parameters. The switch has the task to switch on and off the current of the inductor. An ideal switch does not have a voltage drop over it if it is closed. But there is no ideal switch, so we have to take care that the voltage drop over it is as small as possible. This is one of the main reasons why bipolar transistors are no longer used for these applications. The collector emitter voltage can only go down to its saturation voltage, which is in the range of a few 100 millivolts. The voltage drop of a MOSFET depends on its channel resistance. The smaller it is, the smaller is the produced voltage drop over the transistor. And the smaller voltage drop leads to a smaller power loss and therefore to a higher efficiency of the power supply. 
Another important parameter is the maximum switching speed of the transistor. Modern switched mode power supplies have the tendency to have higher and higher switching speeds. We will see in the following videos why a higher switching speed helps us to reduce the size of the inductor. For now, we only need to know that a smaller and therefore cheaper inductor makes it possible to build very small and efficient power supplies. Something which would not be possible with a classic linear regulator. Unfortunately, higher switching frequencies also lead to higher losses in the transistor and also electromagnetic emissions become more and more a problem. The increased use of switched mode power supplies in combination with the rise of the switching frequency leads to major problems with regard to electromagnetic compatibility, but this will be extensively covered in a few of our next videos. After this brief overview of switched mode power supply elements, we will take a quick look at the different topologies. First, we can divide them into the type of the storage elements. As mentioned before, with charge pumps we are able to generate step up, step down and inverting supplies. With the inductor as storage element, there are two major groups, primary and secondary switched power supplies. The difference between these two types is the location of the switching element. For primary switched power supplies, the switch is on the primary side of the transformer. Otherwise, it's on the secondary side. If we have the switch on the primary side, we have the advantage that we can use a transformer with higher frequencies which makes it much smaller in size and more efficient. A disadvantage is the higher complexity of the circuit. Both types can be used to generate higher, lower or inverse voltages and are called boost, buck or inverting converter respectively. An inverting converter comes in both categories, either a step-down or step-up converter. A third type of switched mode power supplies are flyback converters. They use magnetically coupled inductors to transform energy between the primary and secondary side of a transformer. They can therefore be used as step up and step down converters. The transformer serves simultaneously as the inductor and often has an air gap so that more magnetic energy can be stored. There are a few other topologies that are frequently used in modern electronics like the SEPIC converter, which can generate a higher or a lower voltage on its output without changing the circuitry. Another example is the Royer converter, which is often used for the background lighting in LCDs. As we can see, there are a lot of ways to transform DC voltages efficiently. All use storage elements and switches as core elements. Only their position varies with the different topologies as we will see in the following videos. I'm Christoph with the Institute of Electronics. We hope you've learned something today, but anyways, thanks for watching. For the interested viewer, we highly recommend The Arts of Electronics by Horowitz and Hill, and for our German-speaking viewers, Elektronische Schaltungstechnik, written by members of our institute.